and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and with me in the Rabbit Hole studio today is a producer slash entrepreneur in the film business, Mr. Darren Johnson. Welcome, Darren. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for schlepping to Brooklyn, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> um, so... Um, Thanks for coming. We uh, we always appreciate it when when people uh, come on down here, but uh, let's jump right into it. I, I wanted to. Uh, I'm glad that you're on the show because you've got one of these really interesting backgrounds. Like you've kind of you've done a bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and I you know I think producing is correct me if I'm wrong, but producing is probably your main bag. But you've done directing and writing and probably everything else in the business uh, as well. I've done pretty much everything. Talk to me about sort of how you got into the business and and like give me like sort of your your origin story as it were uh, my origin story is that I um, had a daughter as a young man and I was going to school for fine arts and pushing planes out onto the runway at JFK and trying to make ends meet and um, my photography teacher Jules Allen at Queensboro Community College uh, basically told me to get out of there and go to Manhattan and figure it out, uh, which turned out to be good advice. And I found myself in the film business late. I actually started out in music, worked as a music producer and a uh, manager, recording artist, and et cetera, for m about 10 years. And I kind of burnt out on that and um, went back to school because I had gotten a new computer for... Uh, you know, how to do art on a computer. And I went to School of Visual Arts for that, and I learned all kinds of cool stuff like Adobe After Effects, and well, well it wasn't really After Effects yet. That was uh, Adobe Premiere in the very beginning, and uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, and all those things. And that kind of led me to filmmaking, playing with Premiere. What was your first, like, real film job? What was that? First out? real film job? Yeah, like, w it wouldn't be one that you actually got paid for. Uh, well, that was in commercials. I, I worked in commercials first in terms of, if you just want to look at it from a motion picture standpoint, my first real film that was going to be a thing was uh, Tony and Tina's Wedding, which was a very interesting experience. Um, and we pretty much shot in about two locations total, and we made the film for maybe just a little over a million dollars. And uh, that was my first experience being on a set with like a union crew and having to deal with all the different moving parts of something like that. Uh, it was, you know, commercials usually happen over a weekend where this was weeks and weeks and weeks of prep and weeks and weeks and weeks of shooting. It was a different experience. And you had a mentor on that picture. You Michael Tadros. What, and what did he do? What was his background? Michael is probably and I'm not just saying this because I love him because he's my mentor, he is n the premier producer of film in New York City for probably the past, you know, <laughs> I don't want to age you, Mike, 30 years. Uh, he's worked on, you know, huge films like I Am Legend. He just finished recently working on Ocean's 8. And if you go back far enough, you'll see his credits go back to you know, films like uh, Coming to America. He's actually the cab driver in the beginning of Coming to America. Cool, cool. <laughs> and so you were working with him for a while, mm -hmm. and then at some point you got yourself out to California? Not exactly. I started working in development because uh, Mike had paired me with a producer on I Am Legend, Akiva Goldsman, and usually on big films, like, you know, Mike will put me with someone as kind of like, you know, stay with this guy and make sure he's taken care of, make sure everything's going okay. So it's kind of like my single-minded focus on that film was to make sure that everything was okay with Akiva. And him and I got along really well. And of course, at some point I pitched him some ideas and he liked my ideas and he offered me a first look deal and wanted me to come on to work with him in development and be like his New York guy. Um, and that's how I started working in development, which was a new realm. So you were working with Akiva, who's, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who don't know, Akiva Goldsman is, uh, he's worked on some huge, huge Hollywood movies. If you look up his IMDb, it's as long as my arm. 
Um, so, but you were working with him, but here in New York. Yes, we we started on I Am Legend, and uh, after that we can you know we continued to work together and. What was that experience like in terms of um, you know working in, for a big? Because it's this is Warner Brothers, right? Yes, so it was incredible in the sense that Akiva's uh, original vocation is that he's a very talented writer. He, he won an Academy Award for Beautiful Mind for his writing, um, and I got to learn a lot about the process of developing concepts. You know, whether it be from a book or from wherever, and kind of understood how it's done in Hollywood as opposed to, you know, in the indie world. It's, it's just a different process and kind of a different thinking about it all. And, and it's all of a, it's more of a, a team concept. Talk about that a little bit because some people who might be new to the industry, and th this show is all about for people either trying to break into the industry or people who are trying to sort of level up in their position in the industry. For those people who are on the producing track, kind of talk about the difference because there is sort of a hierarchy to production you've got like assistant to producer associate producer line producer creative producer <laughs> like how does that all work there in the hollywood there, system there are many many producer titles and it really comes down to the size and scope of the project right so one one thing i would say to people is and people hate these kinds of things but you almost have to decide whether you want to be a corporate filmmaker or an independent filmmaker because the world of what I like to call corporate filmmaking working for somewhere like Warner Brothers it's a very different track and a ladder climb that's very similar to being in corporate America um, and if you're not really cut out for kind of the cloak and dagger of it all you may want to reconsider that notion now indie filmmaking is, is a complete journeyman's sport in the sense that you're gonna have to really hustle and grind and find ways to fundraise and create your path. And then you have control over what you're doing in a different kind of a way, in a similar way to a, you know, a Woody Allen or a Ed Burns or uh, you know, some of the more standard independent filmmakers who don't really delve too much, at Darren Aronofsky, they don't delve too much into these huge big budget things. They stay in their kind of Zone, and that's that's kind of like the, the as, as where you're aspiring to get to. I mean, you can cross over like Christopher Nolan, and you'd have to ask him how much he enjoyed his time working on Batman. He could probably tell you some really interesting stories in private. Well, he's coming on the show next week. So. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> you know, so it, it, there are two different paths, and in terms of the producer thing, you know, one of the clearest titles in producing is line producer, which I do a lot of, mostly for small stuff, and I've done it as an assistant on big stuff. But that's the art of the fiscal and physical responsibility of production, pulling together crew, vendors, you know, every little aspect of the moving entity that is a production. And you're looking at line items and budgets and figuring out schedules, and, and it's just the logistics of everything. Now. In terms of you know the big title like executive producer, there's a few ways to get that title. You could be a person who put the money up. You could be assigned by the studio to run the physical production. You're like the main producer. There's these titles get given out accordingly, and it's hard to pinpoint you know what one or another means, especially with the advent of all this kind of like um, lifestyle reality TV. People are getting weirder and weirder titles all the time that fall under producer. Uh, what I will say is that, again, size and scope matters. If you're on a huge film, there's a hierarchy which kind of trickles down from the studio. If you're on a small film, you could be an executive producer or a producer because of a few different reasons as well. It's hard to say. It's like producer is one of those titles that it, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot who gets it and why they get it after you get down from the main producer. So, you know, sometimes if you've uh, created the, the studio hires you to be the primary line producer, then you'll get executive producer title and possibly like points on that film. Right, and it's different for films than it is for television as well. Yeah, it's a whole other world. Yeah, because yeah. there's a, the, like even, I've heard that even people who are like actors, managers will get 
producer credits. Depends it, what's negotiated. Yeah. That's, that's probably the key word is what's Even negotiated. though they probably never, you know, ha- they never touch any of the production. Um, technically, they're responsible for something. I, I've, I've seen um, that happen on many occasions that, yeah. you know, people who are kind of representing talent or whatever, they get like a producer credit. But in reality, the amount of time that they engage in actually hands-on production is slim or none. And then you also have like creative producers, people who are, who are there kind of to shepherd the creative process. So uh, for instance, I, I, I'll give an example I think I can talk about. Uh, an I Am Legend, Michael Tadros was kind of the fiscal, physical producer of what was going on. Uh, Akiva Goldsman was kind of the creative producer of what's happening creatively. And you know, the director works between the two of them to determine what's going to happen and, and how it's going to happen. So you can have multiple produ- multiple producers on set depending on the production, and, and they're kind of charged with different tasks. Like, yeah. would you, would you say that the creative producer is almost like um, maybe maybe I don't know if this is diminishing or a term or a glorifying term, but would you say that they're almost acts like a buffer between the director and the studio? Uh, and, and sort of it could be, it could be, but know. a lot of times it's just there's, I mean, I've a, heard that there's a vision for the film, uh-huh. and 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 I give you an example of you know, uh, people wonder why some of these big films like you hardly ever see someone win, you know, best director or something, because with Hollywood films, back to my point about uh, about corporate filmmaking, there's kind of, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy, and and then you're you're just following the blueprint of the studio and what the studio wants. So there are people in place to, f- to constantly keep a track of what the studio wants fiscally and creatively. And so you're, you're really, it's corporate filmmaking. And, and that's the, the, the illusion like, you know, oh, you get to be a director on this big film. You, you're in charge-ish, <laughs> but there's a lot of people who have a say. Well, that's what it seems like it's happening now because, you know, with, and we've seen it happen recently with big films like in Star Wars, mm-hmm. where uh, you know Lord and Miller were hired to do the Han Solo film, uh, they were fired, um, mm-hmm. and then um, you know there's different things that happen with I can't remember uh, who was originally on the uh, uh, Rogue One picture, mm-hmm. um, but they uh, somebody came in, uh, I think it was a uh, Gilroy came in last minute to do some rewrites and reshoots. Uh, and then, you know, even at Warner Brothers, your old alma mater recently with Zack Snyder and that whole thing with bringing in Joss Whedon. And these are, I mean, I think what people don't understand is like people look at movies like they're theirs, right? Like they belong to the fans and they just love going to movies and love seeing these things. But, you know, when something is 150, 200, 300 million dollars, like that's like building a bridge or that's like <laughs> that's like a major it's, construction it's project. It's kind of a giant commercial. Right. So, you know, and how these things are done, like, and I see more and more, uh, and, you know, see, if, tell me if you, you agree, but you see these studios hiring young directors with, like, maybe a couple of indie features under their belt. Like, Ryan Johnson, before directing this last Star Wars picture, has two films. Like, he did Looper and he did Brick before then. And I don't, th- I don't think he, uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong out in internet land, which you always do. But uh, I think that's the only two things that he had before he got hired to direct the biggest sequel in in the history of sequels, basically. Well, you know, I'll come back to my point about indie filmmaking and Hollywood filmmaking are very different things. And in Hollywood filmmaking, there's a hierarchy and there's a ladder climb, and it kind of is who you know and it is being in the club and being able to you know move amongst those circles and like i said if you if you have the stomach for the cloak and dagger that goes into um moving in those circles then you can find yourself in that position uh but if your concern is being a filmmaker it's very different than working in the studio environment like you're you're in charge of a different do you think that studios are, are hiring these these young guys who are like, for instance, like you know, getting Ryan Johnson who's got two features under his belt to direct the Last Jedi is much different than hiring Ridley Scott, you know, because Ridley Scott is you know he's he's not only a director he's a producer and he's been around for a really long time and he's a force in the industry, uh, you know I hate to to say it or frame it in this way but do you think they're getting these younger guys because they can push them around? 
Um, I, I think that there's a <laughs> there's a lot of uh, you know there's a lot of everything. There's a lot of isms happening. You know, you got ageism, you've got sexism, you've got all kinds of isms in the business that create a landscape for who gets hired and who doesn't get hired. Um, and again, I think that it's not so much about pushing them around. You could be on to something in the sense that people want someone who's malleable because, again, these aren't. this isn't your film. This is a, a Hollywood film with um, many producers, many agents, lots of moving parts, lots of money. They just want you to follow the blueprint and... It's not really your job to get creative out there. Bring it in time. Uh, uh, bring yeah. it in in time uh, under budget. Um, now, let me ask you this, because you talked about taking two different paths. Um, mm -hmm. The way things are now, because there's more and more independent productions being done, and it's it seems to be like, uh, in terms of theatrical release movies, um, you see these with like either like, tough little indie horror films that mm -hmm. are five maybe ten million dollars if that if that you know sometimes they're, they're a lot lower um i know we you know we spoke to richard lemay who did dementia 13 and that was a lower budget film um but like it seems to be those little sort of scrappy little indies that get that get made and then you know somebody like universal pick them up spend some money on them and they'll double their price on they'll, they'll they'll make a decent profit on them and it's and you've got those little guys getting theatrical release and then it seems like everything else is like 150 million dollars and up there's very few uh that seem to be in the middle well my purely opinion on that is that the landscape is changing so drastically that uh, your time might be better served in creating episodic material because there's just such a broad opportunity to place content, quote unquote. Um, content can be anything now, but you know, you may be able to do a better job of getting where you have to go by placing your things within the scope of this kind of more um, episodic content. Whereas the indie film, the way I grew up loving it, you know, kind of like. The stuff I love is more like Wong Kar Wai or um, I like, you know, those kind of older pieces from Adrian Lyne, like the, the Nine and a Half Weeks and Indecent Proposals. That's not really an indie film, but it, it's, a, you know, a more intimate, personal film. There used to be a, a space for that. Right. And I feel like that space is dwindling because the theaters are closing and the person who's very into, like, indie film, you know, even that person's watching stuff more so on Netflix. Um, and the other thing is that I think the attention span of the average human has dwindled for various reasons. It's just not who we are as a, a culture anymore to really sit and pay attention to a nuanced, emotionally involved film or, or something that, you know, really tackles, you know, s serious issues. It's just tough, man. I think that... Um, we've gotten hit with this kind of technology landslide and everybody's trying to figure out and get their bearings and figure out where they fit in and how they fit in. And I'm really not sure where indie film in the traditional sense, 90 to 100 minute film driven by characters and, and you know, strong emotional concepts. I, I'm not sure where that lives right now. And, and that's part of what I think everybody's trying to figure out. If you were uh, to get, you know, if you were to re-enter the business uh, today as a filmmaker, do you think you would have still sort of gone the corporate route and played that game because there was so much to learn there? Or do you think you would have, you know, kind of done your own thing and gone the indie route? Well, um, that might be a tough question. To I answer. did what I did. So mm -hmm. I guess the answer is, you know, I don't know how many times I have to go back in time to make those decisions again and get it, quote unquote, right but in hindsight, this is kind of a, it depends. For me personally, knowing what I know now, uh, I would have kept shooting my own stuff and learning my own way instead of becoming a scaredy cat and listening to people who kept telling me I had to go work with big stuff so that I understood how things work. I would have learned that on my own and I would have grown. And I probably would have already done what I intend to do going forward, which is 
create my own independent stuff, but I had to go through this long gauntlet of learning. Now, here's the however. <laughs> I was trying to take care of a daughter, so anything that had a paycheck attached to it made the most sense for me. Sure, I, I, and, and that's very honest. I mean, and a lot of us are in that position. Like, you know, um, I work as a freelancer in, in film, and, you know, I take jobs that come. I'm, I can't always afford artistic integrity, you know. Um, I got to wrap up, but uh, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about mm -hmm. is um, – uh, we talk a lot about networking on this show uh, mm -hmm. and the importance of networking. And uh, I'm going to do a show, I think, just on networking at some point. Mm -hmm. But um, you, I've heard that you have an app out that's all about film, film, filmmaking networking for, or networking well, for filmmakers. It's actually networking for all media art professionals, photographers, filmmakers, musicians. Uh, the app is called Mixer. And we're still early on, and we're only uh, iOS at the moment. We're working on our, our Android version. But um, the app is really dedicated to creating a space that is more suited for the creative community in terms, and I say that meaning that, you know, some of the other options, LinkedIn or being on Indeed, or those things are kind of stiff and rigid. This is a little more free-flowing and allows creatives to communicate with each other and say, hey, I got this project. It's pretty project-based and connecting-based. So you're, you're, you're essentially able to look at projects that people are working on and say, oh, that looks interesting, and reach out to that person and say, hey, you know, do you need a sound mixer? Do you need an editor? Or, and vice versa. People can post jobs that say, hey, I'm looking for somebody to shoot. I got an sh emergency shoot tonight. And it's very free-flowing and wide open. So um, I, I felt as though something like that was needed. And then I came across this app and ended up communicating with them and ended up working there. And uh, I think it's going to help answer some of those questions we talked about, about what the future of how this stuff all moves forward is. Very cool, very cool. Um, i got to wrap up, but before I go, where can people find you on the web, Darren, if they want to get in touch with you or if they want to hire you? DarrenEJohnson.com. That's D-A-R-R-E-N-E-Johnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N.com. Great. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, thanks for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more episodes of No Rest for the Weekend, uh, you can always find them on our website, btrp.nyc slash podcast. You can also listen to the show on Anchor, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and all those fun places that you listen to podcasts. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank my guest, Mr. Darren Johnson. Uh, for Bonhead Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>